Добрый день. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. We are starting our panel discussion dedicated to trade wars and their influence on the global economy. The current year um, has um, contained new challenges in international trade, and the U.S. is still blocking appointment uh, of the arbitration judge uh, to the um, body of the WTO, which makes the system of dispute settlement in the world uh, less efficient. And we are discussing the issue of withdrawal of the U.S. from the World Trade Organization. The EU. Uh, the, and um, the USA are exchanging claims, and there is still ongoing opposition of the US and China because China is looking for new markets of sales for its commodities. In the prospect, in the perspective, this will have its influence on many countries, and we will uh, face the crisis in the WTO. And it's quite often the case that member states of the WTO are raising the issue of its reformation. Many international experts think that the current trade wars were launched in order to have redistribution of the market um, on the international scale. Is the world ready for the new challenges and for the new rules of trade? This is what we're going to talk about with the uh, panelists. And today we have as guests Robert Koopman, Chief Economist and Director of the Economic Research and Statistics Division of the WTO of the World Trade Organization, Taras Kachka, who is Deputy Minister for Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture, Trade Representative of Ukraine, Manlio Di Stefano, and the Secretary of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Denis Morozo, a chief financial officer, member of the management board of the Ukrainian industrial company Interpipe, Dmitry Loss, advisor to the chairman of the board of MHP, and Stanislav Vilensky, deputy uh, chairman of Aleph Corporation Board, and Viktor Halasuk, president of the Ukrainian Association for the Club of Rome, and in the previous cadence, he was the head of the committee of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine on industry, industrial policy, and entrepreneurship. The WTO has become the battlefield for um, member states uh, for the markets. It is overloaded with cases, and the dispute settlement uh, body is um, under uh, doubt. And we are glad that. Um, the uh, chief economist and director has arrived to Ukraine for the first time. And the uh, IMF states that the current uh, trade wars are one of the main risk factors for global economic growth in the nearest years. What is the opinion from the inside of the uh, World Trade Organization um, and what are the prospects uh, in, through the prism of this statement? Thank you very much, Olena. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, by the way. About 20 years ago, I spent in Ukraine, including in Kiev, um, and it's great to be back. It has been 20 years since I've been here, um, and it's uh, great to see such a vibrant, growing economy. So I'm now going to try to give you an overview of sort of the economics of what's happening in the global economy, the role of trade in that, um, in that evolution, and then I'll talk a little bit about the WTO and WTO reform. So as you heard, there's um, a lot of trade tensions out there right now. I go back and forth between using the term trade tensions and trade war, but we see increasingly um, challenges. You've heard about the US-China, but I want to assure you that this is much more than just about two large members of the WTO. It gets a lot of press, but there's also other challenges going on. Uh, we see conflict right now between Japan and Korea. Um, while it's not WTO specific, we see uh, the Brexit discussions, which have significant implications for the largest trading 
uh, economy in the world, and that is uh, the EU. Um, we uh, have threats of uh, automobile tariffs, and as of yesterday, there was a discussion that between the U.S. and China, there may be a first phase one deal trying to resolve some of their trade disputes. Um, at the same time, the U.S. and Japan have negotiated what's been described as a small deal. And let me put right up front that uh, as an economist and chief economist at the WTO, I worry about these small deals because the small deals potentially violate WTO basic principles of most favored nations. The whole idea of the WTO is that it tries to create, tries to create a level playing field. That means all countries face the same tariffs, they face the same regulatory um, rules, uh, sanitary, phytosanitary, and technical barriers to trade. And what I hear from the U.S.-China deal is that uh, China is promising to buy a certain amount, a specific amount of agricultural products from the U.S. And I can imagine that uh, Brazil and Argentina and maybe Ukraine and others are wondering what does that mean for my potential to export to the Chinese market. Um, let, me, let me move on and talk a little bit about slowing global growth. Uh, you've all heard that it is slowing and trade, particularly trade uncertainty around the trade policy environment is contributing to that, but there are other factors that are uh, driving some of the slow growth and I'll talk about that. My concern about the trade conflict in the long term is that we're going to lose a lot of potential growth. We tend not to think much about potential growth, what we might have achieved, but with this trade conflict, because it's reducing um, global investment, is likely to reduce in a, uh, result in a smaller global economy going forward. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about what is the value of the WTO, this level playing field. All right, so you've heard the IMF has revised its numbers downward from 3.2% to 3%. OECD, World Bank, everybody's revising their global growth downward. Some of that, and a fair amount of it, which is controllable, re relates to trade policy and the increase in tariffs that we see between the U.S. and China and the uncertainty that that causes in global value chains. However, we also know that the U.S. Is, growth is slowing, um, partly due to its cyclical, uh, it, its place in its business cycle. We see the same thing in China. And China's growth pattern is slowing anyway, as expected, as it nears the global production frontier. That easy, fast growth is now much harder, and they have to find new and uh, innovative ways to grow. And as a result, their economy is uh, slowing. Uh, we saw, we revised our trade, our merchandise trade numbers downward uh, just uh, about a month ago, uh, significantly. Uh, from 2.6 to 1.2 percent. Our indicator of services trade growth shows weak services trade growth. And if you look at our latest World Trade Report, which you can find on our website on services trade, you'll see that services trade has been a major engine of economic growth over the last 20 years. It is slowing also, partly due to the, uh, the cyclical downturn, but also due to the trade uncertainties. Um, the concern, as I mentioned, is that all the uncertainty being brought out into the global economy because of the trade conflict is causing firms to ask questions. Should I make this investment? If I make the investment, where should I make that investment? So they're holding off. And investment is by far the most important source of long-term economic growth. Consumption is also very important. Investment turns out to be very trade intensive. So when a firm makes an investment decision, it looks to buy the best for, uh, machine tools, parts, components. Uh, it tends to rely on global markets to bring in the best uh, productive capital. And when investment slows, trade slows in a very significant way. Um, I would also say that the um, that results in this foregone uh, economic growth that's very hard to get back. And I don't have time to go into that, but uh, I can talk at length if there are questions about that. I even somewhere have some pictures. 
I would say that the risks to the future, uh, the, the expectations for the next few months are mainly focused on the downside. Despite the positive news that you hear about a small deal between the U.S. and China, uh, as was mentioned, there's still uncertainty around the appellate body at the WTO. There's also uncertainty around how do we cover new areas like the digital economy? How do we, um, how do we address new areas under the WTO, uh, not just the traditional areas? Actually, here is a picture of what I consider to be the potential for long-term growth costs. The top blue line is a projection we made in 2012 for long-term economic GDP growth for the world if everything goes well. The red line is if everything goes badly. So the blue line essentially is long-term potential GDP. If you look at the green line, that is what's actually happened. So we have been, even before the trade conflict came, uh, came to the forefront, we've been in a period of slow economic growth. And now our concern is that this trade conflict is going to cause that green line to turn down even more. And eventually we have to revise the blue line because the blue line assumed in the, that in the early years there was a certain amount of investment and increase in global capital stock. And some of that has already been foregone and now we're going to see even more of that not occurring. The bottom broken lines there, by the way, that's trade. So that's, that's global exports. But I'm just going to focus on, um, on the blue line. I, I, I would like to say everybody thinks about tariffs as the major driver of trade growth and the major driver, in many cases, they think of economic growth. Before I joined the WTO, I was an advisor to the U.S. government for an independent um, uh, trade organization there. And one of my biggest challenges was trying to explain to trade negotiators and to trade policymakers that tariffs and trade policies that are under the control of governments account for only about 25% of trade growth. The rest of trade growth is from investment growth and consumption growth, macroeconomic drivers. So trade policy is important, but other drivers are also very, very important. And there is a, what we call in economics an endogeneity between trade growth and um, economic growth investment. I mentioned that investment is very trade intensive. If you cannot in, import the best uh, machine tools and capital for your production facilities, then your productivity is going to be lower than it otherwise would have been. So there's this endogeneity effect. Now, this is a measure on the right-hand side of uncertainty uh, that's been put together recently by some academics from uh, the Fed and the IMF. And the red line represents measures of policy uncertainty in the global economic environment. And you can see that there have been spikes uh, back in the 1990s, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, mid 2000s. But then you get to 2019 and uncertainty pretty much goes off the chart. So this means that firms are facing a great deal of economic uncertainty. A large part of that is trade policy, but other parts of that is domestic regulatory and, uh, policy. Uh, Brexit, lots of things that may include some elements of trade policy, but also include many other, uh, other aspects. Um, on the right-hand side is some research we've been doing on trade costs. And the main thing I want you to take away from this is that um, it's still very expensive to trade. The global average tariff is about 8%. Um, the cost of moving a good from the production uh, from the plant to the final consumer somewhere else in the world is still about three times, 300 percent. So tariffs are a relatively small share of the trade costs, but it's a share that governments have pretty significant influence and control over. The other components are things like transportation costs, logistics costs, other regulatory costs, those are, are important. 
Okay, so we know that it's still, trade costs are still relatively high, but they've been coming down. You can see on the right-hand side that they've been decreasing by over 15%. But take a look at the purple line up there. That's services trade cost. Services, the cost of moving services across borders is much higher than the cost of moving goods or even moving agricultural products. And we think at the WTO, that's the future of global trade. I just mentioned our new World Trade Report about services trade. We need to find ways to reduce those trade costs around services to help enhance uh, global productivity going forward. All right, so tensions are high. There's slow growth, and there are many factors affecting that slow growth. There's long-term opportunity costs. Um, I want to take a few minutes here to talk about what is the WTO. How many people think they know what is the WTO? Let me ask this question. I want to see you raise your hands. Is the WTO about free trade? Okay. Is the WTO about fair trade? Is the WTO about reducing trade costs? Uh, not many participants. I would argue that the last one is what the WTO is about. It, it's not necessarily about free trade. Many people think it's about free trade. But the WTO allows countries the regulatory space to protect its domestic economy as long as it follows certain principles around those regulatory environments. In addition, WTO tariffs don't often, often they don't go to zero. It's more in the regional trade agreements that those tariffs will go to zero. The WTO is about bringing those tariffs down and making sure you apply the same tariff to all of your trade partners unless, unless you have a regional trade agreement. So the WTO is, a, is an agreement. It's an agreement between member countries. At no point, and this is a big dispute, Many people say the WTO impinges on a country's sovereignty. And I would argue that the WTO does not impinge on your sovereignty. If you do not want to follow a WTO commitment, there is nothing the WTO can do to force you to meet that commitment. It can allow other member countries to try to provide some sort of uh, economic reaction if they feel like, like their rights and obligations have been diminished. But at no point does it say you must change your law, okay? It does try to provide an economic mechanism that encourages countries to find ways to resolve those disputes. The WTO only works if members believe in it. If members do not believe in the WTO, it ceases to have effectiveness. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are a lot of reform discussions going on right now. Uh, a lot of those reforms are about how do we resolve the, the appellate body issues, and I can talk about those in questions if you'd like. Um, but it's also about trying to find ways to improve the day-to-day -day functioning of the WTO but also negotiate in new areas. And there's uh, something called the joint initiatives, and one of those is on e-commerce, which tries to get to the digital economy. And uh, again, I'm happy to try to take some of those questions uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Since you have already mentioned digital economy, I would ask you the question related to this. Now we have the fourth industrial revolution and the sector is expanding and they got new digital technologies and um, new scope, new volume. Probably uh, the statistic doesn't cover uh, it all yet and therefore um, we don't Probably, probably we now have a high time for digital uh, agreements, for uh, WTO's agreements in the digital field. Maybe it's already high time for you to have such agreements. Yes. Members are trying to have um, a group of members, or a fairly large group of members that covers over two-thirds of global GDP and trade, 
are now engaged in discussions around what we call the e-commerce joint initiative. But as in any WTO negotiation, there's a wide variety of views among members. Um, the good news is that both the US and China are engaged in this discussion. And that's good because they have pretty significantly different views. And so it's important that they discuss. But the EU also has quite different views on how to proceed with um, the digital world, uh, mainly around security and privacy. So these are very difficult discussions, but I'm optimistic that members will find some area to uh, some areas where they can agree. Thank you. Uh, then here comes the question to Taras Kachka, who is the trade representative of Ukraine. So Taras, is Ukraine ready for such agreements and for discussing new digital t technology um, agreements? And how does Ukraine protect, how should Ukraine protect its interests in the new global economy? So let's start with the sensation because Ukraine is one of the 10 top countries which have provided a comprehensive proposal on this multilateral agreement. And if you have a look at the data, so in October we have a week uh, long um, round of negotiations and if you pay attention to the text related to e-commerce, you will see that along with China, the EU and the United States. Um, there is a proposal of Ukraine. We are among the leaders of this global process within the WTO. And probably that comes as a sensational piece of news, but that's really so. So Ukraine is systemically working its future at, in the digital area. And we are rather active and sometimes even aggressive in some areas uh, in relation to the EU, which is trying sometimes to ignore us in the digital market, but we will not leave them. Uh, and uh, we will um, implement one of the annexes to the association agreement and this will be not about uh, just integration of a separate segment of the market but integration into the European market in general and at one of our meetings we um, said that we would work with the US at something that would be rather similar to uh, the section on e-commerce uh, in the Canadian and Mexican and US agreement and also a month ago we spoke about that with the Canadian part aside because um, we are we we think that with the new governments probably will try to catch up what was not regulated when the agreement with Canada was concluded um, and there was the section dealing with services and including digital services so we are among the leaders here and I think that in our trade policy besides classical trade we have a lot of elements which are aimed for the future I at the a digital economy, at e-commerce, and we have a lot of things to be proud of. And what do you think about amending of this agreement, association agreement? That would be simple. Just we have to approve uh, this decision. That will be it. We did this with the energy sector with Annex 27, and that was rather an interesting exercise, which was rather dynamic in the process. But now it seems to be uh, the thing for both parties to enjoy, and we are all happy that we started reconsidering annexes and using uh, the association agreement, adjusting it to the current needs. So we will be doing this in general. And now, getting ready for the committee of the association, um, we are discussing and working at the issues that should be amended in the association through the use of the very tools of the association agreement or through the change in the content of the agreement. So rather frequently, we uh, um, hear uh, the idea mentioned by a lot of um, uh, high rank officials about the need to reform the WTO. So does Ukraine participate in such a discussion and what is the standpoint of Ukraine concerning the reform of the WTO? Well, there is a technical dimension of the discussion and there is a practical dimension of the discussion and there is a philosophical or strategic, whatever we call it. And if we speak about um, 
the technical domain, really there are a couple of issues we are now discussing. Besides the appellate body, we also need to uh, to speak about the judiciary evaluation of the state policy, something that should be done uh, via courts and not via negotiations. And the issue is raised that uh, the adjudicating bodies have uh, become too important and have concentrated too many uh, powers. Um, and the state doesn't have that much power as it was supposed to have. And we think that this court mechanism uh, can be in place and we must have a mechanism in place when we can negotiate, can debate from negotiations and just address courts. And the other, um, no less important issue, which is um, voiced often by the US, is the issue of the status of special and differentiated treatment for the countries um, that are developing countries. And um, mainly people um, consider it to be the battle between the developed countries like the US and the countries which are saying with a more liberal regime, which are called the developing countries like China, South Korea, Singapore, which considers itself to be a developing country. And now in Ukraine has a lot of uh, its own stories. And you know that according to the canons, to the traditions, we are considered to be a developed state. And Singapore is for some reason a developing country. And that's um, the classification we now have. Why did it happen so? That's because we are the state in transition. According to the classification, developed communist countries, which after the collapse of the Soviet Union got transformed into market economy countries, but definitely in many criteria, we are a developing country, like um, by the criteria of GDP volume. Therefore, we are participating in this discussion, and we claim that that is um, a wrong approach, that ICU are a developed or a developing country. It's wrong because um, in some areas you may be a developed country, in, another as in some other aspects you may be a developing country. And uh, this is a technical part, while we also have a more practical part. Since the uh, current crisis of the WTO is the crisis which is related to clear non-compliance, non-observance of the promises which developed countries gave at the beginning um, of the round of negotiations and for uh, of Doha uh, round of negotiations. And for 20 years, actually, they've been deceiving the whole world community and blocking further liberalization of trade globally. Of course, this um, causes great disbalances in the global trade. That's why it's obvious that, in fact, we will have over the next year or next years um, the need to have a new round of negotiations in the WTO. An informative, uh, the one which we had like during the Uruguay round of negotiations. And, and all those wars, all those crises and disbalances aim to uh, bring us to multilateral negotiations in a way. But along with that, there appears a very interesting phenomenon, which is the change of the trade rules. Since what we see now is old orthodoxy uh, and uh, restriction or ban on quantitative restrictions, you cannot uh, restrict uh, trade in the quantitative sense. So what do we see in, let's say, the market of metal? The tariffs of the US are like a domino of investigations and we have quotas. We have quotations on, in the key markets and that will be uh, on the uh, rise. There are some discussions between the US and the chi in China and that is an agreement on the scope of trade which is an absolute deviation from our orthodoxy. And also now we have the agreement on poultry and meat with the EU, which is also a de facto agreement about finding the balance in the uh, market of meat and poultry. And this is de facto a quantitative approach. So this is not the issue of full and complete liberalization. This is um, all about the fact that the markets have developed so much that the global market has been so 
much analyzed it, we understand it, and we can treat it as national markets. And it's no longer about um, updating the uh, tariffs. Now, the rules of international trade are already used for well-guided and managed keeping to the balance in trade. So this managed trade um, com is coming back. And of course, we are ready for this discussion because we are rather serious in our treatment of this practice of managed trade, regulated trade, and we are ready for this sort of negotiations. And this means that we are not focusing on global trade agreements, but on preferential uh, agreements uh, dealing with the trade uh, with separate specific partners uh, and specific goods. This means that for Ukraine, trade diplomacy between states is becoming much more important than uh, global international uh, organizations. I and my successors um, need to spend all our time going from Ukraine to Egypt, Kazakhstan, China, and so on and so forth in order to have negotiations concerning specific goods, uh, realizing all the nuances of the internal market. And trade diplomacy is now becoming more and more in demand. And of course, this influences my schedule, work schedule. Um, Manlio. Reorganization of the economy is one of the challenges for the WTO, and the EU and the US uh, have had negotiations on transatlantic investment partnership in trade, but the negotiations were suspended. Um, what is the um, vision of the, what is the opinion of the Italian side for the, about the future of this project? Uh, probably we will have uh, this limitation uh, Taras was talking about within this project. Thank you, Alina. First of all, thank you for everyone, everyone for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be in Kiev today for this forum. Well, in every speech that we have heard has touched a very important issue on the uh, world uh, economic trade situation. And uh, the um, Italian uh, uh, point of view is, is, is crystal clear. I mean, we are the uh, second uh, larger manufacturer in, uh, in Europe, the fifth in the world. So for us, the open uh, trade is fundamental. I mean, uh, uh, most than uh, uh, one, per, uh, one third of our economy is made on export. So we are uh, fully committed to make the multilateralism being effective, being uh, uh, rule-based, being uh, uh, concrete, and in this, in this view, there is a fundamental need that is the reform of the WTO. The reform of the uh, rules where our trade is based. If you consider that most of the rules are uh, uh, stuck there since decades now, and the economy tremendously changed in, at a global scale in the last just five years, not not 20, not 30 years. It means that we need to start from there. And obviously, we are moving among the European member states. You know that the European Union has the, is in charge to develop the commercial uh, uh, rule for the uh, member states. So when it comes to uh, FTAs, we always move together with the European Union. And in this Mm, in this framework, in this uh, momentum where it is considered to be normal, the bilateral agreement like the China and the uh, uh, United States one, uh, we consider, we still consider the multilateral approach the only, the only feasible one for a long-lasting uh, trade peace. I'm, I, I do agree uh, the need to call it uh, uh, maybe crisis but not war. I think that everything is has to be rebalanced in a, in a, to, to, have a, to guarantee a future of uh, good trade. 
but, they, uh, but, but I still consider it to be fundamental to restart again, not from the bilateral approach, but from the uh, uh, multilateral instruments that we have to, re to reshape the rules that we are, uh, uh, um, that, that are the, the, the house of our cooperation. And in this, uh, in this regard, I will uh, start from uh, uh, some uh, uh, analysis that we, uh, uh, we had to, to have. Like, for example, also internal in the European Union, we have some phenomenon of uh, social and environmental dumping, for example or uh, countries that are even into the European Union with different uh, uh, taxation. So uh, why we talk about sharing a common house in trade, we are facing dumping into the European Union and uh, uh, also outside the European Union. So how do we fix it? We fix it just starting from uh, the values. When the question was made before, what is, what is a, a fair trade? I think that the fair trade is where the benefits are shared and the uh, losses uh, are mitigated uh, in a common approach. And uh, considering that the most important countries in, in an in, in, in economical point of view have to uh, look at the emerging countries like those that has to be in some way helped to create a, a better future for their own citizen. I'm sure that this is not a common value sometime, but it is the only one that it could create a long-lasting good relation between countries. I, Italy in the last, uh, in the last years, uh, our country has gone through different reforms. Uh, I was saying before that we are uh, um, focused on uh, enhancing our international trade, but this goes through an internal reform of what we uh, consider to be uh, the, the framework of action. We have started uh, relaunching the digitalization of our uh, economy, the <coughs> innovative approach focused on sustainability, and we are also sharing this approach with our partners. Consider that uh, we, according to uh, studies that we have in Italy, half of the uh, uh, known job will disappear in 20 years from now. It means that you cannot just think about how to relaunch your economy, but how to migrate your economy to a most advanced one enabled to face the, the, the new demand. And According to this, we are acting for sure into the European Union also to uh, contrast the unfair commercial practices. And when I, talk, when I talk about the level playing field, it is something that we stress in any agreement that we, that we manage to have. Uh, I'm sure that you have heard about the big uh, debate that was in Europe while Italy was signing the new agreements with China last, last year. But we are very proud to say that all the agreements that we signed included what we call the European wording about trade. So level playing field, sustainability, respect of uh, uh, labor uh, dignity and environmental issues. Everything was there. And this is the base. I mean, if you uh, look at the uh, um, values of the European uh, uh, trade, if we were a single state, we, we could really lead the world in terms of economy. So we need to include our value in the agreements that we do, and we need to bring these values inside the reshaping of the WTO and all the other multilateral instruments that we have. And what is the main uh, uh, focus that we are having in relaunching the, the WTO uh, and in general the world, uh, the world trade? Obviously, the uh, relaunching of the negotiation, negotiating function, the reform of the rulemaking activity, the unlock of the statement, the stalemate of the appellate body, and obviously a real uh, fight against the unfair trading practices. I mean, we need to, everyone, we need to restore the credibility of this, the international institution. Because I cannot imagine uh, uh, a future where all the disputes 
are faced among bilateral, uh, uh, according to bilateral uh, uh, agreements or bilateral wars like the one that we have faced now. So Italy is well committed on that and uh, going back to the original question, what, what is the future of the agreements between Italy, so I say EU and the United States, uh, we are really looking at it in a um, frank and fair uh, approach. I, I think that we need to protect some uh, spe specificity of uh, the, the European uh, trade. We are uh, mostly uh, made of uh, SMEs and on the other side of the ocean is a, there is a total different uh, uh, commercial system. So uh, the, the, the table is still on, is still in place. We need to, we need to fix some uh, big uh, issue that is there uh, in place and then we can restart talking about a good agreement. But I think that we need to uh, look again at the redistribution of the, um, of the benefits of the agreements that we sign before to just being uh, pushed by the political momentum. So uh, we are really looking at any single FTA in a pragmatical and analytic way in order to understand if it's feasible or not for, uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you, Manlio. The Ukrainian company Interpipe is in the epicenter of the global turbulence and in the market of metal industry in particular. And last year, Mr. Morozo was sharing the, uh, his opinion about the problems of exporters. And over this period of time, Ukraine has initiated three cases in the WTO concerning anti-dumping uh, duties in relation to uh, steel pipes. And we have had a precedent um, uh, also connected with the Euro-Asian Commission. So what has been the change in the situation for your company over the recent year, and uh, not only for your company, but for the whole metals, metallurgy sector of Ukraine? Well, thank you for the question. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I will try to show you my presentation. Unfortunately, I cannot see my presentation quite well. So just a couple of words about our company, because we are an industrial Ukrainian company uh, which produces uh, steel pipes, uh, uh, wheels for railroad carriages, um, and all in all it's about 1 million uh, tons of steel and we have 12,000 employees over the whole company. That's about our structure. Here is the map of our war, like you know, the war have a map for military action. That's the way we have our war, trade war, uh, trade um, scheme. And export of our product is 75%, which means that only 25% stays here. That's the picture. Here are our key clients, and uh, we work uh, in different fields, in oil and gas, in construction, in different countries of the world, which is engine machine engineering, uh, like uh, Belas, Belarus uh, uh, company buys our products, and here are some pipes, uh, cooling uh, devices, for example, Dubai uh, buys some things from us. As far as we wheels are concerned, so it's even more serious because our share in freight carriages is almost 70 percent, which means that two-thirds of companies are using our wheels in uh, in uh, London, in Paris, in Germany, so you can see our wheels everywhere uh, on the railroads. And we still keep expanding, in particular, in new products, which are passenger transportation passenger carriers, carriages, and we are developing our production. And here are trade wars. 
So what it's all about? Ukrainian mythology um, involves 250 southern people and about 1 million of Ukrainians um, influenced, whose welfare and well-being are influenced by the uh, by this field. These are the people who work uh, in the metallurgy production chain, they produce, they um, do provide some services. This is also this also goes for maintenance and some other works. And about one million of people are involved in this or that way in the field of metallurgy. With the, the sales also and with everything that happens in a metal industry. About 35 billion hryvnias of taxes have been paid to different budgets of different levels by um, our staff and 22.2 percent uh, now is the share of metal uh, industry in export. Well, that's how a lot of uh, world uh, journals have shown this, the beginning of the world trade war, like Trump uh, did this, he started, he flamed the global trade war, but it was not Trump because we used to have the trade war ongoing in different periods and uh, it was also always the case that uh, companies and countries were trying to take some measures all the time. But Trump started and launched the global war, trade war, when everybody started fighting with everyone. Now, we have uh, some restrictions for Ukrainian products, like the customs union. That's a long-lasting war. And now this is the market which is highly restricted for us in different conditions. The other thing is the European Union. Um, you know, it's a pity because um, if uh, we understand why it's so happening with Russia and with the customs union, we used to have a great volume of export there and of course we started moving to the EU, we uh, reduced this volume, but in the European Union for some reason they also started introducing different sanctions. And for example, we may take safeguard which set some quotas and restrictions for our supply to the EU. The same is the situation in the U.S. because also they have some restrictions in place. This is like 25 percent, Section 232, and individually uh, we I have some restrictions for special sort of pipes. In Canada, which is uh, a friendly state, but nevertheless they have made restrictions for wheels, for pipes, and this is also Brazil. So these are the problematic areas. And you see that these are the key markets, which used to be strategic markets for our company, and now they are highly restricted. Let's talk about the European Union. You know, we all, always led great hopes on the EU because that is a large and interesting market. And many years ago, we got a lot of standards for the supply of pipes um, there, but no. I will even tell you more. We have had long-lasting negotiations, but nevertheless, uh, we uh, even established, wanted to establish joint venture with the EU. We wanted to stay more in the market of the European Union. We concluded a contract on joint venture with the European company, and we understood that this would help us to avoid restrictions in the European market. But now, again, the European Commission first set the quota on the level uh, even under, under what we had de facto. So we could not talk about any additional volume of export. And in fact, all the investment which we made into this joint venture, it cannot be implemented now because the quota, which has been set by the European Union, actually has provided for us no opportunity to expand our volume of export to the EU. That's why we have the same figure as we used to have. And the amount is 95,000 um, tons a year. And our joint venture is at now only at the break-even point without having almost no profit.
The other thing is, of course, uh, dumping duty. Um, it was at the level of 13.8 percent. We wanted to have it reconsidered, and uh, this year we managed to reduce it to 8.1, which was an unprecedented thing. But the European Commission, for the for the first time in our history. Uh, behaved um, in a very strange way. They, it applied different methodologies of making calculations. So they just uh, used some tools and some methodologies that allowed them to inflate this duty, which never had been the case. So they just chose a different methodology and they uh, tried to you know, apply some specific tricks to increase this duty to the maximum. And instead of 3 or 4 percent, which we were expecting, we got 8 percent. Well, to tell you the truth, we think that that cannot be done with us, and we will go to court uh, against the European Commission and we will try to advocate our standpoint in the European Court because that is an unprecedented decision. It may never be repeated. So we will go to court and our goal is just to um, state that we are right to prove this. The next step on behalf of the European Union, again an unfavorable one, was that the Court of Steels, though it was small back then, but um, there was a hope that the volume will still increase because the quota was 5%, but in summer uh, it was um, reduced to 3%, again for no reason. And the arguments which were provided uh, by the European Union are not, no, not, not understood stood by us, but nevertheless, the opportunity to increase this quota has gone significantly down. This is um, almost 1.5 times lower, which is also an unfavorable step in relation to us. And now we have even an even more dangerous other country quota. When you have exhausted your quota and there is still some volume in some countries, you may can make some deliveries and supplies within some small scopes within that quota of the other country. I mean that you may take as a country quota and deliver a commodity to the client. So, and now, um, they are considering the issue that access to this quota, other country quota, should be limited. I mean, it should it will be banned. And Taras has already mentioned that the we have the classical idea of the WTO that restriction of um, volume is already a, a thing which is not acceptable. And now we have some need for self-restriction. I mean, they are doing this on a compulsory basis in a way. Everybody, everybody makes you understand that you uh, will either have no chance to um, sell anything in the market or you will have to apply so-called self-restrictions because they will say that, okay, it was not we who imposed this quota. You yourself set the quota. So let's take the example of the U.S. We have their 32 percent of duty. The normal margin would be about 12, 13 from, from metallurgy, I mean. And there we have it as 32.5%. Uh, you cannot make any profit with such a duty. Uh, you know the section 232. 25 percent uh, introduced in March 2018. First, the prices went up by 25 percent in the market, and in fact, all those who were making supplies uh, still had a chance to uh, supply these goods further on, uh, but the prices uh, went up. And now the prices have gone down, and they're going down rather rapidly, and uh, we can no longer supply products to the U.S. market at, at such a rate of duty. Uh, why did it happen so? Because a lot of countries, which also had the same section, came into an agreement with the U.S. about different ways uh, to go around this, to avoid this. And when this flow of import, duty-free import, came to the US, our company became incompatible because uh, we have different rules and that is an absolutely evident case when in the market uh, 
uh, you have uh, great differences. Well, that's actually it. Um, we are trying still to do something about this duty and about this self-restriction because there are no other ways out. Either we can supply products or we will not never be able to do this because at such a rate of duty, it's impossible to do this now. And uh, oil and gas pipes, well, the, the duty there is very high. And uh, the key uh, markets for us are now closed because the, this duty is restricting all our supply there. I will not tell you about Russia. In spite of the fact that uh, we have a high duty, with, we also had an embargo on import of Ukrainian pipes, and we cannot supply, make any supplies there. As far as uh, dumping, dumping duty is concerned, uh, it is um, about 19%. It's uh, um, the same as for Kazakhstan. And it was recommended to make this duty lower, because according to the estimation, it should be about 11%. And it was recommended by the Commission to, to itself to reduce the duty, and uh, it didn't do this. So it was an unprecedented recommendation. Like they recommended it to themselves, and they didn't perform this. So I don't even know what to call it. That was rather strange and rather interesting situation to watch. Unfortunately, unfavorable, but still at the same time funny. But that is pure policy, I think. And uh, there was, there used to be the Persian Gulf uh, member states which never had any restrictions. That was always free market. It was always um, praised and there was free competition. And it was for the first time over many years that these trade wars led to the situation when these countries also got united. and. Uh, never never did this uh, something that was happening there I think that this is uh, a bad thing and probably this key region key for Ukrainian metallurgy uh, will become closed and will have some restrictions and this case shows us that even the countries which were always having free trade in place um, are deviating from free trade and I, they are also trying to close their markets, which is a bad sign showing that in the world there will be soon no uh, free trade areas. And a good piece of news for us, it is again an unprecedented case related to the duty for the customs union. Uh, our duty said there was 34 percent, but thanks to the fact that in the market of the CAS country there was the demand, high demand and shortage of wheels, our um, consumers from uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan made a um, substantiation to the Commission asking to reconsider the duty and under their pressure the Kazakh and the Belarus uh, sites um, who were not able to buy wheels, the Commission passed a decision to reconsider the duty and of, over the period of this reconsideration, the duty was um, cancelled. And uh, as a step of our gratitude, we actually signed some agreements with the Belarus and Kazakhstan parties uh, where we indicated the uh, regulations, the provisions and, the, and principles on the basis of which we will have our trade. And uh, they stated that this duty was a great mistake and they will prevent any situations when such a high duty will be um, installed because they thought that um, this duty was a great mistake of the customs union. Uh, of course, when there is a shortage of some goods, it's very funny and stupid to uh, just introduce some uh, high duties. So this was the case when the consumers actually uh, demanded reconsideration of the case and they achieved their goal, which means that if a consumer wants to get some products from a certain supplier coming to his country, he can do a lot and even destroy all the barriers. But unfortunately, 
In pipes, we don't have this because the competition is much higher there. There are a lot of suppliers, and there is no loyal consumer like we had in a case with wheels. Thank you for attention. We keep on fighting. Uh, we don't have any other options because only one force of our uh, trade uh, is Ukraine. And uh, we have trade wars and we have high duties almost in all the regions where we are selling our products. And we are trying to advocate our interests. And our goal is to increase export, to increase sales. And then in Ukraine, we will have high GDP and high economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. This year, a company MHP uh, actually um, had some self-restriction in terms of meat and poultry sales to the EU. And it was for the first time that amendments were made in an association agreement between the European Union and Ukraine. Dmitry, what do you think? How do trade wars influence business? And what methods are applied by the European uh, and by American um, producers to lobby their interests? And how do you take this attack? Well, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I'm glad to welcome all of you here. And a lot of it's already been mentioned from my colleague, um, by my colleague from Interpipe that the situation is dynamic, it is ever-changing, and uh, it will never stop. The changes will never stop. We need to understand that the global policy uh, doesn't exist uh, uh, without uh, trade uh, policy and without economic um, criteria. I would consider this issue from several levels, the first of them being uh, business, the level of business, the area of business. And we should talk here about diversification of our sales markets, because the fewer you have, the more affected you will be by trade wars launched by a certain party against you. And um, this will be only the issue of not losing the market, one market, but um, of uh, it becoming uh, of some market becoming less important for you. The other uh, thing is um, analysis, analysis and business analytics, like what is happening in the European Union, what is happening in the Middle East. For example, a signal that something is going to change and you need to change your policy in relation to the masses could be a very trivial thing. For example, Saudi Arabia has uh, stopped providing support to its own farmers, which means that uh, uh, their farmers had to um, take some additional steps to develop uh, on themselves. The third thing is that you should be oriented at the output, at the outcome. The moment you get relaxed, the moment you understand that the situation has stabilized, become more stable, you lose. And if you have export contracts signed with some countries and you may sleep for five years um, absolutely um, without being uh, concerned about anything, you lose. Well, you have two or three um, percent of the market, in particular of the export market, um, it's uh, okay, but you are not a threat for the national producer. When you have 10 or 15 percent, you're already a threat. It's, it's good if you still have consumers and you're still in demand, and then uh, happens what my colleague from Interpipe has mentioned, that internal consumers will take away your interest. But if there is some internal output with which you compete, um, th that is what will happen. And we have had a similar case uh, um, with Iraq when internal consumers write that, please protect us, because there are Ukrainians, and that if they uh, keep selling further, then we will lose our jobs. And business should bear it in mind all the time. It should always bear it in mind that it is not the only one in the, on the planet. And if there is uh, too high dumping, if there is some incorrect behavior in somebody else's market, um, that will provide uh, some opportunities to the state to say that, OK, guys, we are advocating your interests, and we introduce 
duties or introduce some tariff or non-tariff measures to regulate the situation. And here we are going over to the other level, to the second level, which shows that business should think at this level. What would business do if uh, tariffs are changed, if quotas are there, and if, in case with the European Union, quality standards are changed or any other things happen? Uh, should the business go to the state asking for protection? Well, uh, business tends to forget about two things. No trade representative, no ministry will be capable of, capable of um, advocating all your interests because they have limited resources and limited time. And business should become a logical assistant of its own state. It should maintain its own office, have its own uh, team that could lobby team could, that could advocate your interest. There is again an example with the EU. We are an agrarian company, and our competitors are France, Spain, Poland, Italy. Sorry. Okay, guys. So we will probably try to come into agreement with Germany, with some other countries which are uh, not that critical in relation to our products. Not that. Uh, well, don't criticize it that much. But therefore, the issue of literate um, uh, lobbyism is of importance. We, we don't have to complain and feel sorry. Business should be responsible, and business should help its state to advocate its interests with the resources it has. And if we consider the situation with the uh, EU and the situation uh, with the, the so-called unlimited tariff, which in fact was not there. Uh, it was just um, the tariff set for the category of uh, products others, which included a specific set of factors. And de facto, well, it's now that the EU says that after it has lost its war, says that Ukrainian companies were using some um, legislative tricks. No, it was not that. For six years, the European experts have been preparing together with other experts the association agreement. And in that agreement, they actually envisaged that if Ukraine keeps using this third line, Ukraine will be forced to build uh, plants in the territory of the EU and give jobs to people there. And when Ukrainian companies appear to be effective, um, uh, France, for example, which is an agricultural country, started arguing what was happening. And after that, the deal, which uh, will, um, which was ratified by two parliaments, is a kind of a example of bilateral agreement uh, in which a comprehensive solution could be found um, on the basis of proper estimations and calculations. That is an example of how disputes uh, between, uh, between countries should be settled. But we don't have an illusion that the issue will be settled today or tomorrow because um, in a year's time, we will need new negotiations. And you know, local producers will always want more. And exporters will always be in a more vulnerable situation. But we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should just clearly understand what we are going to. And the last issue I would like to cover is the issue of representativeness. In every field inside Ukraine, we uh, perceive uh, companies which are our competitors as competitors. We have war for clients, uh, war for our brand, but we should bear it in mind that in the inter in international markets we are becoming allies, in particular if these are companies representing different sectors. There are some classical examples of the work of our companies, Ukrainian companies in Africa. You come there with a monoproduct, you get um, an immediate dumping from local producers. But if you come with five products, seven products, and when you are a unique team, 
a united team, you have more chances to win. That's why when uh, we cover the issue of what trade wars are like, uh, this is probably the way to uh, put on weight and to lose weight. So these are like challenges and opportunities. Is it complicated? Yes, it is. It will always be that, like that. Thank you. Stanislav, your corporation is producing a wide range of products. And what are the fields where you are witnessing uh, growth of uh, import and how are you uh, solving these problems of trade wars? Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm deputy head of the board of the Olive Corporation. Um, and this is a rather diversified corporation which deals with the large number of directions in business. Majorly we deal with production and this production is in the field of construction materials connected with this product. And unlike to previous speakers, I would like to say that the products which are produced by us are mainly uh, consumed inside the Ukrainian market, though uh, there is also some amount of import, some volume of import. And of course, um, I'm not well aware of the, in the export of uh, pipes. Uh, Mr. Morozov has been speaking about, uh, and our cooperation has the Oscar uh, production union, which produces seamless special pipes. The volume of uh, production of these pipes is very small, but um, their uh, specific um, cost is very high for each pipe, and therefore we have also had a great pressure in terms of restriction of import coming from Ukraine uh, for these products. But now I would like to tell a couple of words in a different topic, which is the topic of uh, protection of our internal market against the import of different products. And that is the issue which actually, the question which Alana asked me. The point is that we are producers of plastic profile of some accessories for windows, for doors. Uh, we also have for concrete articles, uh, cement, and also apples, which you probably saw in the leisure area here in the center. And what are the challenges which are, we are faced with? Well, first of all, that is an attempt to enter the market of Ukraine with dumping prices. A lot of companies are doing this, both the EU companies and that is also done by Chinese companies and Turkish companies. I'm going to give you several specific examples. In particular, starting with April 2019, we have had an anti-dumping investigation related to uh, gas uh, concrete. And here we are talking about uh, import to the territory of Ukraine of this product, which is produced in Belarus. Uh, the point is that this product is not highly marginal, and it depends uh, on uh, logistics and a lot of other factors. Nevertheless, and particularly this is, her, this is felt in the central and the western part of Ukraine, the volume of import coming into our market really affects the situation of Ukrainian producers in the market. We have also felt this, and our cooperation inclo includes the gas concrete uh, production uh, plant. Uh, of course, in the east of Ukraine, um, they don't feel it that much, while in the central and western of Ukraine, uh, western Ukraine, we feel it because of this pressure. And we hope very much that in the nearest future, I hope it will happen not later than in spring 2020, we will see some results of this anti-dumping investigation and we will get uh, some specific result. And we have a very special situation as far as I remember, and I'm not definitely an expert in this field, I'm just a businessman and not a lawyer and not a politician. So as far as I understand, the rules 
or the opportunities provided to the WTO member states, there is an opportunity for introducing temporary interim anti-dumping measures until the decision is passed. But unfortunately, as far as I know, in Ukraine, we don't have the procedure of uh, return, repayment of those uh, duties, which will be paid uh, in case uh, of in the, the, the commodity is imported, but the, when the decision within this investigation is not yet made. That's why we're not passing such decisions. Another example which I could give is production of some accessories for uh, windows and doors. Uh, our cooperation has the only uh, plant in Ukraine which produces these goods. Um, and we uh, provide uh, um, export uh, to a lot of countries of the world, and we also sell it, of course, in the territory of Ukraine. These are accessories that this, this is furniture, in fact. Uh, on the one hand, we um, make export to Germany and also to China, where we are different category products. But in the market of Ukraine, we really feel a lot of pressure uh, made by Turkish producers. I understand that um, we are pressed for time, so the situation is the following. Any Ukrainian businessman is trying to think about the following things. How to protect its internal, its domestic market, how to make it a premium class market. And of course, you can take some protectionist measures. But nevertheless, uh, I think that a clever person always understands that any protectionism should, to a certain extent, be limited. Because if we have an overprotectionism policy, you may reach the situation of being isolated, which for our country would be a disaster. Though we are considered to be a country with developed economy. Uh, thank you for um, providing this information to me, because I always thought that we have a developing economy. But if it is developed, we will have to fight with this. Uh, but for us, not to have isolation, we definitely need to take some protectionist measures, but they should be limited. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Stanislav. Viktor, you are um, one of the leaders of protectionism movement in Ukraine, and some of your legislative initiatives, like uh, dealing to timber, um, uh, have caused trade wars. And, well, support of the national producer is a topical thing, and it's a good thing. But along with that, it's a rather controversial one, as our discussion shows today. You, as the president of the Ukrainian Association for the Club of Rome, um, how you assess the uh, opportunities for the protection of the interests of Ukraine for the benefits to exceed and surpass negative, possible negative elements. Thank you for inviting me. It's a, my, a pleasure for me to come to the Kiev International Forum, Economic Forum for the sixth time and to see a lot of uh, people's deputies, international experts, producers. And our topic is extremely important. I would like to start with the following. What is trade war? If we have a look at the very essence of this concept, of this notion, trade war is global fierce competition for better uh, country specialization, because every country, the same as every individual, has his, its own specialization, uh, which helps it earn its living. These are some products um, due to which the country is known in the world. And if we have a look at Ukraine, Ukraine's specialization, we will see an absolute dissonance with um, the, the fact that we are considered to be a country with developed economy. You have two visual schemes behind you on this slide. Here is topical statistics coming from the European Commission showing that the products of the industry in the export search of the EU accounts to 82 percent. That is the statistics, uh, international statistics for Ukraine. And we can see that raw materials exceed 50 percent in our export basket. And if we take note 
only formal uh, raw materials, but real uh, quasi raw materials, the most primitive raw materials, that will account for 70% of our export basket, which means that the profession of the European Union uh, is producer, while professional specialization of Ukraine, unfortunately, is donor of resources, of raw materials, of people. And no matter how paradoxic it is, um, our profession is threefold donorship and being a creditor, which um, uh, offers some uh, credits. In fact, it is a cornerstone of trade policy, commercial policy, and this determines the future of the country. A good piece of news is that this can be changed. I mean, the Ukraine specialization can be changed. And you may do it uh, through correct uh, policy. In Harvard University, we have the Economic Complexity Atlas, which um, produces this sort of uh, color maps, color schemes, showing what uh, each country stands for. And you can see that Ukrainian export mainly states for agricultural raw materials. And unfortunately, in metallurgy, um, there are not that many products uh, Mr. Morozov was talking about. I mean, products with high added value. And uh, we have a lot of um, other products. Uh, just have a look at that. Minerals, iron ore, and other things, ashes. And at the same time, have a look at the export of Turkey and Poland. Um, absolutely different components. That is machine engineering, metallurgy, chemical industry, a very powerful one. Agrarian complex is represented by ready made commodities, by foodstuffs and not by raw materials the way it is in Ukraine. Um, have a look at Poland. Uh, the picture is even br more bright because we have their electronics, uh, uh, domestic appliances, and high tech components of production. What does it affect? This affects everything because our uh, volume of export basket, according to the to the World Bank, is 16 billion dollars. In Turkey, it is about 200, and in Poland, it is 280 billion dollars. Uh, though we have almost the same population. And this is the answer to the question why the country's specialization is the most important critical factor which determines whether we are going to be rich and happy in our country or uh, whether we are going to be dependent on highly respected international creditors and suppliers of ready-made commodities from abroad. Unfortunately, the status quo is like the one we see in the map, which is not a good piece of news. But we also have a good piece of news because because Poland and Turkey were not born like that, and everything which we see on the, in the, on the map uh, on, on the scheme was the result of their targeted uh, policy, economic policy. Poland did it for several decades, and I, it's a pleasure for me since I saw Grzegorz Kolotko today, who was uh, one of the architects of this policy. And Turkey did this over 10 years. Erdogan came to power in 2002. I'm not talking about the political component, but just about economic policy. And in 2013, Turkey uh, um, gave back the last dollar of credit to the International Monetary Fund. And before that, they were getting these credits for 40 years, which is the longest period of that taken in the history of the world, which means that we need to change the history of the country, because raw materials always cost three, five times less than ready-made finished commodities. Just take timber. A ton of timber costs $70, while a ton of products of the furniture made from timber uh, costs $3,000. Or let's take uh, metal scraps um, when you make some cisterns or containers, some reservoirs, which is not e even a high-tech product, that will be already 3,000, uh, which is three times more. So uh, how far-sighted uh, should we 
B, in order to understand that uh, we should produce ready-made products in this country. Therefore, trade wars are an integral element of economic development and the opportunity to change status quo. If somebody is satisfied with the status quo, he will just say, OK, what we need is free trade. And even these countries, at a certain stage, are using the instrument of trade wars. And I do agree with uh, my colleagues, uh, producers, that trade wars have always been the case, and we will always have them. Have a look at the experience uh, of England, how it became economically powerful. How did they do this? In the Middle Ages, approximately in the 14th century, the main uh, sector was wool making. They were selling wool unprocessed wool, and in other countries, like in the Netherlands, in Italy, uh, they were producing finished commodities out of this wool. And at some stage, England understood that it could not last any longer. And the Tudors started uh, what we now call trade wars. They started making some restrictions. Uh, they didn't provide uh, that many licenses for export. They introduced export duties, which uh, set some restrictions. And um, as a result of that, over the period of 100 years, they uh, were carrying out this protectionism policy. And this Elizabeth, uh, the first uh, fully banned export of wool uh, from England, because they already had um, a top rank uh, production facilities, and England started becoming a very powerful state in the economic sense, leaving behind all those who had been before it, who had been ahead of it. Um, today, the largest trade war launched by the U.S. has been already mentioned, and uh, it now accounts for about $300 billion, uh, which are under the ban of import from China. Well, you know, even the country which would be most interested in free trade, since it has the best developed industry, still would like to improve its status quo. Here are universal mechanisms of economic growth. And through correct economic policy, sometimes including trade wars, we can change economic structure. That's what we saw in the first slide. And via this, we may affect economic growth. Because if we become the raw materials colony, then 3% of economic growth is the maximum we could be dreaming of in the long-term prospect, just dreaming of. But if we implement this protectionism, economic policy in the industry, and are trying to really get the shares in the external markets, we will uh, get as a minimum 7% of growth, and that has been proven by the experience of other countries, and partially even by the Ukrainian practice. Because uh, please recall it, Ukraine used to sell sunflower seeds abroad to buy sunflower oil. But after the parliament uh, increased the duty for uh, the ex export of sunflower, Ukraine created production facilities over several years, and now we are exporter number one of sunflower oil. Now Ukraine controls 55% of the global market of sunflower oil. And it's a pleasure for me that I have something to do with uh, some of those protectionism activities uh, since I, I was also one of the architects of timber export ban, which uh, gave a lot of investment into the Ukrainian economy and which provided an incentive for the development of this industry, let alone environmental issues, which are the key um, criterion, which is the key criterion. Also, uh, we um, had a metal scrap uh, duty, and that also helped us save about $2 billion uh, and also 30,000 jobs. And Mr. Moraza will probably uh, tell the exact figure. So we have cases like this. These are important cases, and they fully correspond to the uh, commitments which Ukraine has undertaken both to the WTO and under the DCFTA agreement, because there are certain exceptions there. And if there is political will and the willingness to help uh, the country, the, govern, uh, the government officials have to use it. Ukraine is one of the most open markets in the world because our tariff protection market is included into top 10 countries with the lowest tariffs, customs tariffs. And uh, until our um, agreement with the WTO, uh, our market is open, but 
what, have we const have we like built good industry? No, and that's our mistake. I just came from, come from Cape Town, where there was the global meeting of the Club of Rome, and I listened to the speech of the president from South Africa. And in his 15-minute speech, he managed to tell what tools they used to involve investment, including after A and industrial parks. And they agreed about 13 billion of investment into South Africa, and the plan for five years is 100 billion. Do we see it all? Or export credit agency. I think that your in, in investment into interpipe steel, the new plant, um, has been supported by export credit agency, right? And this is the agency which supported um, supply of this equipment. And Ukraine should do the same by our export credit agency. Uh, we should supply commodities and not just raw materials. Development bank. Well, the mechanisms. Uh, this this is a mechanism which every country uses, and all the, the countries uh, where the government is not competent or where the, there is no liberal policy and there is only dictatorship, and uh, where they are trying to keep the status quo on an artificial basis. Status quo is not something we are satisfied with. And as far as conclusions are concerned, I will just give one of you. That is Professor Reiner's quotation. Don't do as the rich countries tell you to do. To do what they did to get rich. And uh, if any of you is interested in this, uh, at 4 o'clock we will have a public talk with Professor Reinhardt and his presentation of his book, The uh, Bestseller, which has been translated into more than 20 languages of the world. Uh, well, thank you for attention. I'm ready to uh, for questions. Thank you, Victor. Actually, we don't have any time for questions, but um, we can just briefly comment or we may get some questions from the room. Just a couple of minutes, but just be brief. Good morning, Gushva, you are the director of the Center of Market Economy Development. That is a, question, a simple question. We have heard that Ukraine has marginal deficit of uh, balance, and in the structure of our balance we have mostly raw materials, 60-70%, and in the structure of input we have ready-made commodities, finished commodities. Uh, now we can see the government's development program, which has the goal to uh, make export increase double-fold. Uh, but the previous problem, program also um, was supposed to do this through FTA agreements and so on and so forth. Uh, what is the mechanism to make this um, export be increased doubtful. Maybe there is Mr. Kachka's plan, uh, which has not been included into the government. And what measures, what recipes would you provide for the Ukrainian economy um, besides the recommendation uh, provided by Professor Reiner? The question is addressed to <coughs> Mr. Kachka. Well, Kachka's plan can actually be seen on Facebook. That is my plan. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, we should not, of course, try to uh, deprive of any technologies and deal with wool. That's the example from the previous presentation. Uh, no. We can make our export increase uh, down double fold uh, the way Turkey did this with its currency. I think that it's going to be in inverted commas very good in relation to people because, in fact, what Turkey is doing is increase uh, export uh, through cheaper labor, which is not a social approach. But uh, this means that uh, economic development will be um, achieved by ordinary people um, because their salary will be lower. Uh, I don't want to criticize anyone and to criticize the program because, you know, of course, I would also like to go somewhere and to agree, uh, make agreements on uh, sales of some pipes, of some um, computer-aided uh, um, devices, like the Netherlands with Taiwan are doing. But I have good producers. 
um, products which look rather simple, but they are not. Just try to grow grain. When you do this, you will understand that grain growing is a much more complicated technological and production process than some than growing of some, than production of some industrial products. Therefore, I'm glad that our agrarians are developing in such a good way. I'm not happy that the industry is not developing in a good way. That is not a personal accusation, uh, no, no personal complaints, but just when I hear that agrarians um, are developing, um, I think that this is good. They are active. They are developing their business dynamically, and I'm inspired by this. I would like to do the same with railroads, with trams, with uh, trains, with carriages. Um, and uh, now we uh, are thinking about the uh, supply of our tra trams to um, Alexandria. And this is all the question for business, because every, pro every product could be sold uh, abroad, but just produce, do something. And that is the only recipe, I would say. The government will never build carriages. The government will never build anything. The producer is doing this. Victor, just in brief, please. Uh, Taras um, has reacted to uh, Professor Reinert's uh, phrase, which is good. It means uh, we have a high-profile discussion. And Professor Reinert, who has the MBA of Harvard University and PhD, PhD of Cornwall University, will have a speech uh, at this forum. And you can yourself ask this question. And uh, you may read his book and make conclusions whether to follow his piece of advice or not. Also, I've seen Grzegorz Kolotko. And in the next forum, we will we'll have Chandram Nair. And I think that we need to study the best world practice and the policies which made other countries of the world a success. And in the focus of attention, we should have intensification of economic of industry. Trade is just an additional auxiliary function. But if you are not producing added, uh, high added value your goods, no trade will ever help you. Uh, you will just be a poor country. You will be developing through raw materials, and that's what we have in Ukraine. Like export has increased threefold over the last three years, and that has not made Ukrainians uh, happier over these years. And uh, we shouldn't listen to the stories that it should be like that because international producers like this. Well, well, it's not the case. Okay, thank you. Just one more question from the audience. Um, please be loud if you're doing this. Please give the microphone for interpreters. Thank you for your speech and for your presentation. Um, I am Vladimir Lasuk from Ukraine Industry Expertise, Research and Consulting. Um, uh, Ukraine has entered to WTO about 15 years before. So on that time, we were maybe very romantic as to the global competition, and our industry actually was not adapted. We have been spoken about this beforehand. And now we have discovered that in developed country, uh, there are a lot of very sophisticated instruments which support the national corporation, especially, namely, for the more financial instruments. Uh, so uh, what, will, what could be your recommendation now for Ukraine? Should we to establish and organize such instrument to support our cooperation in Ukraine, uh, like those uh, which are now very active in uh, developed country? Because in this moment we do not any in Ukraine. So what could be your recommendation? Should we act similar? Yes. Thanks. Um, let me just say, it's been an extraordinarily interesting discussion. We've seen the complexities of trade policy played out here. We have firms complaining about anti-dumping and protectionism in other countries, uh, other firms asking potentially for such protection domestically. We have uh, a proposal that there should be a significant industrial policy focused on exporting. And let me assure you, once you take, undertake industrial policy for exporting, there are going to be members in other countries that are going to say that's unfair, and they're going to try to stop it. Um, so I think it's really important to realize that economic development is moving much more in the area of services. 
and that manufacturing is becoming digitally intensive, automated, um, and requires a completely different skill set among for workers. Um, sure. So if you're thinking about economic development, yes, you want to pay attention to being competitive and trying to create a good environment for innovation and competitive firms, but you really need to be focused on making sure you you allow your resources to flow where most of the growth is going to come from. And that's services, financial services, IT services, healthcare, um, a whole array of things that people want and face less import competition for. Um, so I, I'm not sure I answered your question that precisely, but um, I do think one needs to be careful about trying to pick winning industries without understanding where your comparative advantage is. I will absolutely agree, comparative advantage changes. And if you don't have a flexible economy that allows adaptation to changing comparative advantage, um, you're going to lock yourself in a low growth environment. Thank you, Mr. Koopman, and the organizers claim that one more question can be asked and unfortunately we have to leave. Uh, I have a question to the Deputy Minister for Economic Development. First of all, it's a comment and, well, if taxes were not to be paid for a, for a special official, I would not pay for you. And the second thing is you, as the Deputy Minister of Economic Development, what specific actions and measures do you see in the support of policy? Because your policy is not pro-state one. Why? Because you're not going to support uh, your producers, domestic producers. My domestic producer is my father. No, but we are not talking about your father. Well, you know, to tell the truth, I've always been irritated by questions like this because what producer are you talking about? Could you mention any specific? So is there really a question? What specific producer is meant? Okay, high precision devices which are produced in Ukraine. Which ones? So are we going to speak in detail about this? Yes, let's talk specifically because in such discussion, I, um, you always keep asking questions which are not specific. I'm ready to protect every specific producer, but when I am told that I need to uh, produce uh, to protect a specific producer, I don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we don't have time, but the, the point is that it's necessary to create at the level of the state not the support of national producers, but the conditions, the environment in which we could support national producer. So um, that's what we have been talking about at our panel discussion, trade wars and their influence on the global economy. And unfortunately, we don't have any time left, so I would like to express my gratitude to all the guests who have come, uh, to all the speakers for a very nice discussion. And uh, it should be pointed out that any trade war uh, finishes in the truth and uh, in peace. So let's hope that this peace will uh, be something we will have in the nearest future. Thanks a lot.